how can everybody's natural acceptance be same? Is it the same for everybody or is it different for different people? For example, um, I may like to get up early in the morning. Somebody else may not like to get up early in the morning. So for me, it is naturally acceptable to wake up early, but for somebody else, it may not be. Yeah. Is it the same? Yeah. So let's look at this, you know, what this natural acceptance is. So what we are saying is that this natural acceptance is something which is there as a part and parcel of my being. This is what I accept internally, deep within. If I ask, as I had in this example, that we do we have a feeling of this, you know, uh, acceptance of uh, the what is naturally acceptable to us, the feeling of relationship or feeling of opposition, right? Can we get this answer from within, or we have to look for this answer outside? So we have this answer within. We only have to start addressing it. Ask this question from within. What is my natural acceptance? To be in relationship or to be in opposition? Within. Similarly, if you ask, what is naturally acceptable to you? To be in a state of harmony or a state of contradiction? To be in a state of happiness or a state of unhappiness? So all these questions can be directly asked from within and we get the answer. So the answers are there. It is there in us as an integral part of our being, as something which is innate, something which is invariant, something which is uncorrupted. Yes. And <laughs> we can see that this is you know, invariant with time. Right? It does not change with time. It's not that when I was young child, I had a natural acceptance for relationship, but now I have a natural acceptance for position. So I continue to have this natural acceptance for relationship. It is invariant with time. It is also invariant with place. So whether it is in India or America or anywhere, the natural acceptance is for relationship and not for opposition. Now, the question is that, is it same for all people or is it different for different people? So if you ask the same question, whether this, we have the natural acceptance for relationship for one person and natural acceptance for opposition for another person. So does it change with person? The answer is no. But the example that you have taken is that I like something, the other person likes something else. So how can this natural acceptance be same? So if you look at what natural acceptance is, you know, it is different from this liking and disliking. For example, I have natural acceptance for nurturing my body. Right. But when I go into the details about how to nurture the body, then I may have different likings. One may like to eat food, eat, eat rice. The other person may like to eat chapati. And even within the rice, one may like to eat one kind of rice. The other person may like to eat another kind of rice. But as far as the acceptance, the natural acceptance for nurturing the body is concerned, both of them will have this natural acceptance for nurturing the body. Whether they are liking rice or chapati within the rice, one kind of rice or the other kind of rice. So that liking 
can be different for different people, which is basically trying to work out the details about how to ensure nurturing of the body. But as far as nurturing of the body is concerned, every one of us has natural acceptance for nurturing the body. And this each one of us can verify. So if we ask whether we want to nurture our body or harm our body, what is our natural acceptance? The answer will be certainly nurturing the body. So now you can see the difference right, between this natural acceptance and the liking and disliking. So we have written this down here. Natural acceptance has to do with what is my relationship to the reality of concern. So whatever reality I'm you know, addressing to, for example, body here, you know, my body, in relation to my body, right? What is naturally acceptable to me? Do I want to nurture my body or do I want to harm my body? So it has to do with my role. It has to do with my purpose in relation to that particular reality which I am addressing to. So in this case, I am addressing to this reality called body and I'm asking this question to myself as to what is my role with this body? What is my purpose in relation to the body, right? Now, if we ask this question, <coughs> this role is very definite. This purpose is very definite in relationship. Right? So with body, my role, my purpose is to ensure nurturing of the body. And this is definite. And because this purpose, this role is definite in relationship, therefore, the natural acceptance is definite. So, for example, you can see here that our natural acceptance is for nurturing the body and not otherwise. However, when it comes to the details of how to fulfill this relationship, this role, we have to get the necessary details through observation, through analysis, or through some other source. And this source may be another human being or some written documents or something in the internet and so on. So this details of how to ensure nurturing of the body, for example, right, can be different So these details may have varieties, there may be different possibilities, and therefore there is variety, there is different possibilities when it comes to how this role can be fulfilled. Right? For example, details of how the body can be nurtured. So we all have natural acceptance for nurturing the body, but when it comes to the details of how to nurture the body, one person may have liking for rice, as I mentioned. The other person may have like, you know, liking for chapati. And even within the rice, one may like one kind of rice, the other person may like another kind of rice. So we have to see both of them. We have to see the natural acceptance for our relationship with that particular reality of concern. And that will turn out to be definite. And then we have to see how we can ensure that you know, a role, that purpose. Okay. And in that detail, there may be a lot of varieties, there may be a lot of different possibilities. And we should be able to see both of them. <clears throat> so this another example we have taken here, that if you look at this feeling of respect, right, in our relationship with other human beings, we can always ask whether the feeling of respect will be naturally acceptable or feeling of disrespect will be naturally acceptable. And the answer is the feeling of respect. Right. So this natural acceptance for the feeling of respect is something which is innate, which is invariant, which is universal. Right. 
which is uncorrupted by the preconditioning. <clears throat> and this leads to harmony within, right? harmony in the self. It leads to a state of happiness in the self. And this is definite, of course. However, when we go about expressing this feeling of respect, there can be different ways. There can be different ways. I can express this feeling of respect to elders by touching their feet. I can express this feeling of respect to my friends by shaking hands. I can express this feeling of respect to the younger ones by <coughs> blessing, you know, giving the blessings. But all this time, I have this feeling of respect and that feeling of respect is something which is naturally acceptable to me. And it is also naturally acceptable to the others with whom I am sharing this feeling of respect. So while feeling of respect is naturally acceptable and definite, its expression with different people in different circumstances can be quite different. Similarly, you know, when you look at this expression, while the expressions will be different for the same feeling, which is naturally acceptable, right? the expression only is not going to suffice. Expression only is not going to suffice. We have to have the feeling of respect and then we have to express it, right? With our external gestures. So when it comes to expression, when it comes to the feeling, it is going to be definite if it is based on our natural acceptance, if it is based on our under right understanding, or it can be indefinite if it is based on assumption. So this feeling part, this purpose part, this role part is something which is definite okay, when we verify it through natural acceptance. So what we are saying is that this is what can be verified through the natural acceptance. This feeling, this purpose, this role you know, can be verified through natural acceptance. However, when it comes to the expression of it, there can be variety. As we just mentioned, there can be creativity, there can be variety, there can be different possibilities, right? And therefore, <clears throat> that is not what is to be checked through natural acceptance. So this difference we have to keep in mind that whether we want to nurture our body or to harm our body can be verified through natural acceptance. But whether to eat rice to nurture of the nurture the body or to eat chapati is something which has to be, you know, worked out <coughs> depending upon the circumstances, depending upon the availability of rice, depending upon my state of the body and so on. Yes. So this is if we look at this, now we'll see that yes, this natural acceptance is definite for each one of us in all time in all places, and it does not vary from individual to individual. Yes. So can we say that this um, natural acceptance has to do with feeling, and uh, um, that is definite, and the thoughts related to that, or the expression of that can be different in different people. Yes, so what we are saying is the feeling the basic feelings that is related to my role, to my purpose in relation to that, you know, reality that we are talking about, that is definite. And that can be verified through our natural acceptance. But when it comes to the desire, details of how to fulfill that feeling, that role, that purpose, then the details may have variety. So when I'm thinking of how to fulfill you know, that feeling, that role, that purpose, then there can be a lot of variety. 
So the feeling will be definite and it can be verified with natural acceptance, but the thoughts will have variety. Variety under the guidance of this feeling. So I can nurture my body by eating rice. I can nurture my body by eating chapati. I can nurture my body by drinking milk. You know, there are so many ways of doing it. Right? And depending upon the availability, depending upon my condition of the body, I will decide to eat either rice or chapati or so when I'm in South India where rice is grown easily, right? I'll prefer to take rice to nurture my body. But if I'm in north where wheat is grown, you know, or maize is grown, so with convenience, <clears throat> then I will prefer to take chapati with wheat and or maize or you know, whatever it is available. Similarly, depending upon the nature of my body, I will decide, you know, what to eat. But in all that, my acceptance is for nurturing of the body. And I'm trying to work out the detail with that feeling of nurturing the body. So the thoughts may have variety, but the feeling is def definite feeling of nurturing the body. Yes. So the likes and dislikes are at the level of the thoughts and the natural acceptance is at the level of the Yeah, likes and dislikes are not even at the level of thought only, but it is down at the level of expectation. Mm. The taste, which is still, you know, lower than the thought. So we have the desire, there we have this feeling. Then we have the thought that is trying to work out the details of how to ensure this feeling or the fulfillment of this feeling. And then we have this expectation where we are trying to work out how we relate to the world outside. Right? So whether we eat rice and with a particular type of rice, you know, overcooked, half cooked, uncooked. Right? Now that is the level of expectation. And there you have this liking and disliking. So most of us are living at the level of expectation. We have not moved even to the level of desire, leave alone the level of feeling. So we have to slide, you know, slowly move up. <clears throat> Yes. I like that there are you know, many questions about natural acceptance that keep coming up. Yes, yes. I mean, the questions I can see, I mean, they are uh, already uh, answered. The first two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this, Whether this like... natural acceptance is universal. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Is it the same as, you know, what we say, inner conscience, inner voice? So many names are there. Is it the same? Uh, this might be a, you know, something that keeps <clears throat> up. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is very clear that the natural acceptance is universal for all human beings across all people, you know, of all countries, religion, caste, and so on. And of course, it is same over all time and all the space. This is something which we can verify and which I have already, you know, kind of responded to. The third question in this uh, uh, category is, uh, is natural acceptance the same as inner conscience? Yes. In fact, we have been talking about, you know, this conscience. We say that my conscience does not permit, but we have not been systematically accessing it. So it seems something to be well, you know, but now we can very systematically investigate into it and see that it is not vague. It is something very definite. Right. So this natural acceptance that we are talking about, you know, can be seen as conscience. It can be seen as inner voice. It can be seen as pure observer and many such names we will give, you know, as we go on. 
we will see we have been vaguely talking about these things as con about the conscience about the inner voice you know about this observer you know the pure observer without being very uh, clear about what it is now what we are saying is that we have to systematically unfold this start referring to this start looking at this you know, and unfold this discover this what we said you know so we have to discover this natural acceptance this conscience this inner voice this pure observer which is a part and parcel of my being an integral part and parcel of my being and which keeps giving guidance to us or at least keep telling us you know that what is going on at the level of imagination at the level of feeling at the level of desire is not something right or something right is something right but we are not systematically accessing that guidance from the inner voice from the conscience now what we are trying to do here is we are you know systematically looking into this referring to this inner voice this conscience this natural acceptance and making it as a guide for our feeling for our thought for our expectation for our imagination so we can certainly call it the conscience the inner voice the intuition the, you know the pure observer but as we go on <laughs> along we'll see you know it more clearly some yes. people they do so many um, you know, bad things murders and so many things and then we say they have no conscience so then how is it same for the people everybody has <clears throat> yeah so right thing to say would be that they are not paying heed to their conscience mm. not that they have no conscience right there is there have no inner voice but what we should say is that they are not referring to their conscience they are not paying heed to their conscience to their natural acceptance to their inner voice and this is interesting you know the moment you think of stealing right at that moment you feel that uncomfortability within you feel that contradiction within you may do it you know because of your belief because of your preconditioning because of your forced circumstances you may decide to steal but the moment you have a feeling of stealing something right this is not naturally acceptable to you and you have this contradiction within and therefore you are in a state of unhappiness within so while i go about stealing because of my preconditioning because of my training because of my beliefs right or because of the four circumstances but deep within i am not comfortable deep within i am not in harmony that we can check i keep asking this question you know that suppose you are thinking of taking revenge from someone right for 2 hours you thought over it and then after that you drop the idea right these 2 hours were you comfortable within or uncomfortable within were you in a state of harmony within or a state of contradiction within state of happiness within or unhappiness within like this you can check so when you have this feeling of opposition with someone and you are thinking of taking revenge this feeling of opposition is not naturally acceptable to you and therefore you are not feeling comfortable with it you are not in harmony within you are not in a state of happiness within and because you have dropped the idea after 2 hours the other person does not even know that you have done so much of you know work for him but as far as you are concerned you suffer that is one kind of extreme example but around us we have to follow social norms so you go for a party and they say you must have wine something you know 
So you have to <clears throat> to uh, live in that relationship. You have to follow the social norms, the traditions, and all that. Yeah. So we have to verify these also, or because and there must be you know we have accepted these social norms. So there must be some difference between my acceptance for these things and some. Uh, Thing which is natural for me, so there must be some difference between these two things. See these norms, you know, and these traditions. If you look at the uh, way they are developed, it, we can find out that they are developed to express certain basic feelings, right? Or they are. Best, I mean, to uh, ensure the fulfillment of certain basic roles, certain basic purpose, right? So there are two things. One is the basic feeling, the basic role, the basic purpose, right? Which is set by the society. And second thing is that certain way is worked out to express those feelings. Or fulfill those roles, those purpose. Right. So this is whenever we are, you know, looking at any of the social norm or the, you know, the family traditions that we have. We must be able to distinguish between the two. and when we can distinguish between the two we can ask these two question number one whether this goal which is set by the society right whether this goal is right or not whether this role this feeling is right or not right and this we can check through our natural acceptance the second question that we have to ask is whether these norms and traditions are able to meet those goals in the present time, right? In the present time, in present situation, or not? So these are the two questions that we must keep asking to ourselves. If we do that, then these norms, these traditions will be very vibrant. If we don't ask this question, they will become dead norms and dead traditions. And this is the problem that we keep facing. Many of these societies, you know, long old societies, they have this problem that they are not able to ask this question to themselves and therefore, you know, evaluate their goals the purpose, the feelings, and also evaluate whether these norms, these traditions that they have been developed at some time and situation is relevant, is serving the purpose or not serving the purpose. So we must ask this question, both these questions, whether this goal set is right or not. And second, whether these norms, these traditions which have been set at some point of time under certain situations, is it you know, applicable, equally applicable to express those feelings, those roles, you know, that purpose? This we must keep asking. So for example, this wine that you have mentioned. We have some feeling of joy, you know, and we want to express this, share this with others. Right. So we call people and we express this, you know, joy with everyone and we offer something. We offer something which is, you know, easily available, you know, and which is liked by people around. It could be some tasty food, it could be some, you know, thing or the other. So we do that, right? We offer sweets, we offer, you know, tasty food, you know, fruits and so on. 
so the purpose is basically to share that joy you know with others so there is a feeling of affection for the other there is a feeling of care for the other and with that feeling you know we are ex you know sharing this or we are expressing this feeling through offering tasty food or offering sweets or things like that so which is fine right but this is what i was saying that you know we have to check whether it is you know the goal set is correct or not you know whether the feelings are right or not now if you look at the wine for example it the wine has one implication that it can help to express this feeling of joy you know and sharing this feeling of joy with the other right but when it comes to the body i also have to see whether this wine is going to help nurturing the body so it takes care of sharing you know feeling of sharing with others feeling of affection with other but does it take care of the feeling of nurturing my body uh, we have two conflicting desires yeah so now we have two you know conflicting roles two conflicting purposes here and therefore we get into trouble so i can offer something you know which is uh, not tasty and which is also nurturing the body so i need to update this social norm that certainly i have this feeling of affection for others so i want to share my joy with him so i will call this the other person and then i also want to nurture my body the other person also wants to nurture his body so therefore i will offer a food which is nurturing for the body so i will update that social norm that you know family tradition and this is what i am saying that i must check for the role the purpose which is set by the society or by the family the feeling that is set by the society or the family and i must check whether this feeling or this role is being fulfilled through this you know norm this tradition that is being you know accepted this is something that uh, i may not be aware of in the tradition but sometimes say for example um, my boss wants me to do something that is dishonest and uh, that is hello that is dishonest dishonest if my boss wants me to yes. do something that is dishonest now here i am forced it becomes my forced natural acceptance that i have to follow it yeah this is a forced acceptance not natural acceptance <laughs> so i am forced to do it right and when i am doing it i am unhappy with it right when i am doing it for certain you know um, kind of uh, goals that i have set which may not be naturally acceptable or may be naturally acceptable in order to fulfill those goals i am doing something under the enforcement by the boss right which is not naturally acceptable to me but the moment i am you know doing it or may, the moment i am even thinking of it i am uncomfortable within yes right i am in a state of unhappiness within but i do it because i want to achieve something else but as far as this honesty or dishonesty is concerned i have natural acceptance for honesty and the moment i have this feeling of dishonesty right i am uncomfortable within i am in a state of unhappiness within right but i don't but i don't have yes My it seems that i don't have choice it seems that i don't have choice so we have to analyze that situation further but as far as this acceptance is concerned it is not a natural acceptance so it is a forced acceptance 
which may or may not be in accordance with the natural acceptance if it is in accept in accordance with the natural acceptance i will willingly like to do it i am calling it force ex- acceptance only where, because i don't see that it is my natural acceptance or it is in accordance with my natural acceptance and therefore i don't want to do it but i am forced so three types of acceptance we can see one is this natural acceptance something which is naturally acceptable second is just this acceptance which may or may not be naturally acceptable so when we go by beliefs preconditionings assumptions right without verification then we have many acceptances which may or may not be natural then this this third one forced acceptance so i am forced to accept but it is not in accordance with my natural acceptance so these three types of acceptance can be seen there can be many varieties but these three at least we can see that you know that acceptances which are naturally acceptable or not naturally acceptable these are the broad two category right it can be based on beliefs preconditioning which i think you know is my ownership so i do it but when i have those feelings those acceptances in me i feel uncomfortable within if it is not in accordance with natural acceptance then this forced acceptance is that i know prima facie that yes it is not naturally acceptable and given the choice i would not like to do but i am forced because i want to meet some other purpose and that can be made through only if i submit to the boss but all these things we can start you know observing within and when we observe and when we see the harmony and the contradiction and then we make the choice to be in harmony or to be in contradiction you know then things will start working you know uh, at least we'll be able to sort out many of the things yes and for example very simple simple case you know if the wife has cooked the food with lot of you know uh, commitment and if the salt is less by chance you get into reaction you start shouting right you get angry now there we have a choice we may not have a choice to begin with with the boss right but we certainly have choice with our with the wife you know with the children to get angry or not to get angry to get into this feeling of opposition or continue with this feeling of relationship feeling of affection feeling of care that choice is always there but we get angry on a small thing you know like salt is less and we start doubting the intention of the wife that she doesn't care she doesn't bother and then we throw the plate and there is a big prop you know fight for no big reason so there we can certainly ask you know that i am doubting the intention of the other i am having a feeling of mistrust on the other right is it naturally acceptable is it desirable if i can see that it is not desirable i will not have that feeling because i have the choice to shout or not to shout to have this feeling of opposition not to have that feeling of opposition so i will have a feeling of relationship a feeling of affection you know i can very simple thing to do is to take some more salt and put it there that's it or ask her to give some more salt so it was so simple if i had maintained my feeling of affection feeling of relationship then i would have been comfortable with him and i would have also comforted you know the other person so it is not that always some boss is sitting and giving instruction and i have no choice most of the time we have choice and even with the boss we have choice that we will see later but but you can see most of the time we have the choice and we are making the wrong choice because we are not looking into our natural acceptance and by way of our preconditioning by way of our you know, kind of sensation 
we are getting into the feelings which are not naturally acceptable, and therefore making ourselves happy, unhappy. And when we express this feeling to others, we make others also unhappy. Yeah, we keep using this term right understanding. So what is this right understanding? How do I know whether my understanding is right or wrong? Is it the same as the natural acceptance also? Yeah, what we are saying is that through the process of self-verification, we can see what is right for us and what is not right for us. Right. So what we see, you know, is right for us. That is what we are calling as right understanding. Now there can be some, uh, you know, can uh, indicators of whether it is right understanding or is not a right understanding. So these are some of the indicators that we have mentioned. That is, if I am understanding the thing, you know, the reality in a right manner, then number one, it is satisfying to me. So I am the judge. Whether it leads to a state of you know, satisfaction in me that, yes, I have understood this reality. Number two, is it invariant with time and place? For example, this feeling of respect that we were talking about, you know, that feeling of respect is what is natural in relationship. Now, this is a reality. And when I understand this reality, I feel satisfied, you know, within myself. That yes, I have understood that this is the feeling which is naturally acceptable and not otherwise. And this feeling will remain invariant with time and place, right? So it is not that today I have an actual acceptance for this feeling of respect, but tomorrow it becomes disrespect. And similarly, for all human beings, it is going to be same. Every human being will have this natural acceptance for feeling of respect. And it leads to a state of harmony within, in my living, in my behavior with other human beings, in my work with rest of nature. So if I have this feeling of respect in the relationship, and if I express this feeling of respect to the other, it leads to a state of harmony within and harmony with the other human being. And I would like to continue with this feeling of respect. Right? So I will naturally accept to continue with this feeling of respect, you know, with this understanding of reality. So if so these indicators are satisfied, I will call it right understanding. Ultimately, I would say that when we go on understanding the specific realities and our relationship with those realities, then there is a process of building up. And ultimately, I have to see the whole nature, the whole existence, and my relationship with this whole existence. So when I see that, then I am seeing the realities in its completeness. That is important, you know. So I am seeing the reality not in isolation, not only in relationship with me, but I am seeing the reality, you know, in my relationship as well as in relationship with the whole nature, with the whole existence. So that process of right understanding is completed there. And that is what we are calling as realization. So we begin with this right understanding, but ultimately it has to converge in realization where I'm able to see the realities in existence, the basic realities in existence. And we are also see this basic reality in its completeness in this context of the whole nature of the whole existence. So there it will be completed. So natural acceptance is a root, you know, is a kind of base uh, through which we can proceed to have right understanding. Right. So right understanding, of course, will have the confirmation to this natural acceptance. 
but then it is more than natural acceptance because this natural acceptance is something which is there within me right in relation to that reality which i am trying to understand so this reality is more than just my natural acceptance so when i am understanding the reality in its completeness i am understanding you know many other details then my relationship with that reality so through natural acceptance i am trying to verify what is my relationship with that reality which we have just mentioned but then this reality has something much more than that so when we are saying right understanding okay, it covers all that is there regarding that reality but this can you know there it can be a good beginning to start seeing the my relationship with that reality on the basis of my natural acceptance so we begin with natural acceptance but that's not the end of right understanding of a reality but it will certainly conform to my natural acceptance but now we say that uh, right understanding is the same for everyone but then everybody's um, right understanding can be different like um, i can choose i uh, stay home to take care of my children when they are small that is right understanding for me and uh, somebody else i know um, who goes to work and that is right understanding for them even though small children are in the home so everybody's right understanding is different for them that is okay that is right i mean <clears throat> we should differentiate between understanding and thinking <clears throat> so what we just talked about about this feelings and the thoughts right the feelings we can work out you know what is the right feeling right the thoughts yes thoughts can be different there can be variety the basic issue is that do i want to care for my child do i have a feeling of care for my child do i want to have this feeling of care for my child developing the self of the child nurturing the body of the child do we have that you know feeling do we have an acceptance for this feeling so when i am looking at the child as a reality one aspect of it is my relation to that child you know that reality and i am saying there when we talking about this purpose this role this feeling that is going to be definite for all of us but that is a part of that understanding you know now when i am trying to think about the details about details of how to care for the child how to nurture the body of the child how to nurture the self of the child right or develop the self of the child then we can have different ways of doing it so for a person who is not able to afford the next meal for the child okay he would certainly prefer to go and work you know for a you know few hours or the whole day and bring something for the child to eat what a person who has enough right and he can be there at home and produce things okay, more than what is required then he would prefer to be at home work work with the child take care of the child right and not go outside you know searching for a job so that depends upon as i said the time the situation and all that you know the resources the details of how to fulfill this feeling of care you know the feeling of guidance that we have for the child how do we go about fulfilling it the details can be different but the feelings are going to be same so this child is a reality and my relationship to that child 
you know, when I'm looking into it, I'm trying to understand it. There, the feeling will be definite, but the details may be different. You know, the thoughts may be different. The expectations may be different. Therefore, the fulfillment, you know, the details of the fulfillment will be different, which is quite fine, you know. I mean, if I can understand all this, that the basic feeling remains the same, the expressions may be different, then I can see different expressions and not feel disturbed about it. I'm, I don't think that there is uh, something is going wrong. Uh, is going wrong. For example, if I understand something and I want to express and I'm expressing it in English, you know, it is quite fine with those who can understand English. Right? But if somebody else is expressing it in Hindi, which is also that is also very fine. As far as this feeling is concerned, if that is right, then it can be expressed in English, it can be expressed in Hindi, it can express in, you know, not even verbal language, it can be expressed by just simple signs. It is fine with most of these art forms. They are different ways of expression of this feeling of affection, care, feeling of guidance. So as long as these feelings are fine, the expressions may be very different. And I'm willing to you know, understand all that. Evaluate and accept that, yes, because the feelings are right, therefore these expressions, different expressions are okay. Yeah, so it's uh, almost seven o'clock now, Ganeshi. So shall we stop here and take uh, this thing, or take one more question? Yeah, we can take one more question. <coughs> okay. Yes, and then close and open up for the other things. So there is this uh, uh, thing that you know, we are talking about things in absolute terms. Yeah. Uh, so there's nothing absolute. Uh, it's very objective. I mean, very subjective. This uh, exploration, uh, uh, you know, about natural acts. What is natural for me? What is natural for somebody else? What is uh, right understanding for me? What is right understanding for somebody else? These are very object, uh, very subjective things. So there is nothing sort of definite, nothing absolute. So can you comment yeah. on? That? Yeah, I am saying two things. One, I am saying when we are making this statement that there is nothing absolute. <laughs> is this statement absolute? <laughs> that's one question, but that's not the answer. You know. I'm just <laughs> cross questioning. You know. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> when we look at this absoluteness, you know, I mean, I would like to use a milder, milder word, you know, that is definiteness. So, are things definite? That would be my you know, question, rather than absolute. When we say absolute, it has a lot of loaded meaning into it. So I will ask whether it is definite or is there something definite when we are talking about things, about reality, right? The answer is yes. So as far as the purpose is concerned, as far as the goal is concerned, they are definite and universal. And we have taken many examples. You know, as far as body is concerned, right? Nurturing the body is my purpose, is my goal. Right? And this feeling of nurturing the body is something which is naturally acceptable to me. So this is something which is definite, something which is universal. Any human being in any part of the world, in any time, any space, right, will have this natural acceptance for nurturing the body. <clears throat> so there is this definiteness, there is this universality. So yes, there is there are definite things when we talk about any reality or about relationship to those realities. 
<clears throat> However, when we talk about the details of their fulfillment, they will have variety. They will have variety. And that is where we have the, we have a lot of space for creativity. So this definiteness does not debar this creativity. In fact, this definiteness gives you the continuity, you know, for being creative. So as long as this nurturing the body is there in the back of my mind, the back of my thought, then I have, I can have a lot of creativity of how to nurture the body how to nurture the body. Right? So different ways, so many you know, plants and shrubs and herbs and fruits and nuts are available for nurturing the body. We can grow so many things. And when we grow, we can process them, you know, make very tasty food, which are very nurturing. So a lot of creativity is there. But the creativity is there in how to, you know, nurture the body, not on whether to nurture the body or not to nurture the body. So if we start becoming creative there, then there is problem. So we will cook food which is nurturing and tasty. But if you start making food, cooking food which are tasty, even if they are not nurturing, then there is problem. So there has to be definiteness about the purpose, about the goal, about the feelings, about the role. You know, there has to be definiteness. You cannot have creativity there. You don't need to have creativity there. But when it comes to fulfilling the goal, the purpose, the role, the feeling, we can be a lot creative about it. That's a very good so I can shake hand, I can bow my head, you know, do many ways, you know, to express my feeling of respect. I can offer, you know, some flower, some piece of clothes, you know, to express my feeling of respect. But see, this is what happens, you know, like at one time, every house hold had some land where they were growing vegetables, you know, growing some flowers. And these flowers were offered as a sign of respect, you know, to anybody who comes in the house. So it was a very simple thing, you know, you have flowers every day growing, you know, and simplest thing, accessible thing to offer to the other. Now that same norm now has become so expensive. Now we have bouquets which cost thousands of rupees. And then you have competition over who offered how big bouquet. You know. But the idea basically was to express that feeling of respect. And it was done with whatever it was available, you know, immediately. Yes, true. Yes. So the feelings are going to be definite and universal. Expression is going to be very you know, creative, varieties. Uh, I have a one question, sir. I, I used to mentor some students. There's one student who is very naughty and cheating in the exams. I just have a conversation with him. I, I asked him whether you're feeling comfortable when you're cheating. He said, no. But uh, like after that, what he told me that, uh, sir, I'm for 30 or 40 minutes, I'm not feeling comfortable. But when I successfully cheat and the uh, rest of the day, like when result declares everything, I will be in a very comfortable mode. So yes. uh, I, I take a risk, but uh, after that, I'm in a comfortable, but I could not be able to convince him, sir. Yeah, that's how we are operating, most of us. That we think something very important for our success. And then there are certain ways which has been, you know, developed and accepted to ensure that success. So what has become important for us is that success 
in in respect to those points those things and not our happiness or unhappiness but ultimately we want to achieve things only for ensuring state of happiness within so this is a uh, you know kind of uh, short sightedness that we have that we think that certain things are important without connecting to happiness and unhappiness and once we have decided that these things are important then we are willing to do anything for it and we are not concerned whether in the process we are going through the process of happiness or unhappiness so this has to be made clear you know and that is what we are trying to do we are trying to make it make us see that ultimately we want a state of continuous a state of happiness in continuity and therefore whatever we do whatever we feel whatever we think right, every moment we have to make sure that we are in a state of happiness within right for that it is necessary that we are in a state of harmony within for that it is necessary that we are having the feeling which is in accordance with my natural acceptance so this has to be done every moment otherwise what is happening is that we are not aware of this happiness of this harmony of this natural acceptance and we are doing things which is leading to unhappiness contradiction right and we are going ahead with it with lot of unhappiness with the hope that when i achieve this particular thing it will lead to a state of happiness so for example we think that we should come first in the class because that will help us to get a good job good salary lot of physical facility and when i have this lot of physical facility then i can enjoy life now this is the argument with which we are going but we are not paying attention to the fact that when i am thinking of you know copying from others is this feeling you know of cheating is naturally acceptable to me at this moment of time when i am thinking of cheating right then am i comfortable within am i uncomfortable within am i in a state of happiness within or unhappiness within this i have to start asking otherwise what will happen is that we'll keep doing things which are not naturally acceptable right with that we'll be in a state of contradiction and unhappiness within and we'll continue to work with this unhappiness with the hope that at some point of time when i get a good job and good salary and good physical facility i will enjoy that physical facility and be happy so this happiness becomes more like a marriage you know you are running behind it right not reaching there but in the process you are unhappy so this is what is happening with most of us we think that we will accumulate lot of money right and we are running after it we don't know how much money but somebody has said the parents the teachers the society that you have to have lots of money without telling you how much that lot is and then you are told that you know you have to earn that money by hook or by crook so you are running after that by hook or by crook and in the process you are unhappy most of the time this is what you see with most of the people you know they are so restless they are so uncomfortable within so much boiling you know any small thing and they will start shouting does it indicate that they are in a state of comfort within or uncomfortable within uncomfortable uncomfortable within so this is what is happening you know so we have to take a pause look at all this in fact if you really look at the kind of physical facility that we have today is far far more than what is really required most of us we may have many things which we have not used for years you know we have bought it we have kept it at home 
and we have not used it for years. But we just buy it because, you know, that is the kind of uh, conditioning which is done in the society. And then in order to buy that, you have to earn money and in order to earn money, then you have to do so many other things which you don't like. But this is going on. Cheating is one example. Taking bribe, corruption is another example. All kind of crime that you see is basically motivated by this lack of you know, right feeling or motivated, motivated by the wrong feelings. For the purpose, we are not very clear. So we want to steal, we want to exploit people. I mean, even people I was mentioning, people who have lakhs of crores of asset, even they are busy exploiting others. So they will not be able to consume this much of asset in their lifetime, in few generations. But they are still busy exploiting others. Now, are they comfortable within? Or they are uncomfortable within? In a state of harmony and happiness within or in a state of disharmony and unhappiness within? That they have to start asking. If they start asking this, you know, they already have so much of asset and they don't know what to do with it. They do not ensure the right utilization of it. They cannot. So much of physical safety. How will you make the right utilization of it? So if only these people start asking this question to themselves, you know, that this feeling of exploiting others, is it naturally acceptable to me? Do I continue with this feeling? They will be able to see the point and overcome it then probably they will be able to contribute to the society in a much more meaningful way. Yes, sir, I, I need to uh, explore more to convince at this level. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, and, and I would say that don't try to convince, you know. I would say that, you know, share with him, you know, Kind of be uh, have a comfortable <coughs> relationship with him so that he feels comfortable to share with you, and then just pose this question and leave it to him, sir. When you are giving the example of uh, nurturing a small child, you gave two cases the first case when the family is need of money, so I have to go, so that was the first choice you gave. Then the second, I have plenty, so there's no need for me to go for a job, so yeah. I can take care of my children. But yeah. I come up with the third choice where I have enough to run my family, but I'm ambitious. Yeah. So I want to go for a job. In that case, how we are going to justify, sir, that I have to go for a job because I'm highly ambitious. I have, uh, I want to reach greater heights. But still, I have to take care of my children and my family. So how you are going to justify the third case where it is concerned with my individual passion dream? Yeah. I will not justify. I will let you to find out. Okay, I'm answer. sorry. I'm sorry for the term justify. Sir. <laughs> so, so my concern would be that uh, you have a holistic, you know, uh, kind of understanding of things, as I was mentioning, just, you know, in this session only, that you have a holistic, you know, understanding of things. And then you can see all things of your concern, you know, how you have to relate to the child, how you have to relate to yourself, how you have to relate to your body, how you have to relate to the society, you know, to your family members, all that you have to understand and then in the light of that holistic understanding, you have to work out the priority. So this is something which every one of us has to do. Okay, so sir. when we are doing that, then we'll be able to decide the priority, you know, and then decide whether to go for the job, you know, 
or to take care of the child at home. And if I am able to do both, that there may be another choice, you know, do I do something meaningful for the society? You know, mm. how do I contribute to the society? Yeah. How do I contribute to the nature? All those issues are there. So I have to have this holistic understanding about the whole existence, about the whole nature, about myself, about my role in this nature, in this existence. And then in the light of that understanding, I will have to sort out, you know, what I have to do every moment of my life. So that will be a right kind of choice to make. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, yes, thank you. It's 7.30 now. And there are still... How do you uncover your natural acceptance or find out um, everything about the self just by, you know, what, what is the process of that? How do we go about it? <laughs> yeah. When we are saying understand, understand the uh, existential reality through self-exploration, what we mean is to understand the essence of it, not the, you know, kind of uh, the details, but the essence. So that un those, under you know, essence can certainly be understood. For example, if you see the whole existence and try to understand it, you see that there is this harmony, this relationship, this coexistence, which is at the base, which is the essence of all that exists. And we all have this natural acceptance for relationship, for harmony, for coexistence. So this is something which is already reflected in us. And when we start paying attention to ourselves, to our natural acceptance, we can see that this relationship, this harmony, this coexistence, which is the essence of existence, is already reflected into each one of us, and we have natural acceptance for it. So if only we start paying attention to our natural acceptance, we can see this relationship, harmony, coexistence as something which is naturally acceptable to each one of us. And then we can work out the details. You know, we can look into the details of what this relationship is, you know, what this harmony is, what this coexistence is. So this is what we have to see through, you know, what is, this is what we have to understand. And everything that we see, all the units that we see in nature is an outcome of this process of relationship, harmony and coexistence. So this is something which we can see within ourselves. Right? And I can observe it. I can, you know, understand it. And then as and when necessary, I can go into the finer details of things. So existence, coexistence, for example, if I try to explore into this, I can see that there are units in space. And these units in space are broadly of two kinds. We have these material units and we have this unit of consciousness. And my body is an example of this you know, unit of material. Myself is an example of the unit of consciousness. And of course, all this is in space. So I can look into the details of this material unit. I can look into the details of this consciousness unit and I can see that this are in space, they are submerged in space. And that is how this coexistence is. So all this is there and all this is accessible. You know, the essence is accessible to each one of us. We just have to look within, you know, and start observing. And when we start observing, we are able to see them. So in that sense, we are saying that the essence of this whole existential reality is reflected into each one of us. You know, in, at the level of self. And if we start paying attention to it, we are able to see it. 
So this is what we are trying to say when we are saying we can understand this existential you know, reality through the self. The second thing is that, you know, to begin with, when we start working on this, what I am and what I really want to be, you know, then it seems to be a very difficult process. In a sense, it is difficult, but it seems to be more difficult than it is, you know, when we start with it, because till now, most of our focus is outside. We think that this body is important. The physical facility is important. The material world outside is important. And therefore, we have been paying attention to it. And we have paid enough attention to it. We have been, you know, trying to investigate, analyze, understand things outside. Right? And that is how we have this science and technology and you know, engineering and things like that. But now what we are saying is that what is there outside is important. The body is important, the physical facility is important. But more than that, this feeling and relationship is important. And ultimately, this understanding in the self is important. That is what we have said. What we have seen, you know, that for human being, physical facility is important, but feeling in relationship and understanding in the self is also important. So when we see this, that the self is important, you know, we start paying attention to the self, right? So we are just beginning to start paying attention to the self. And when we start paying attention to the self, we have these two part of the self, you know, broadly speaking. This one part is what I am in terms of my desire, thought and expectation, and what I really want to be in terms of my natural acceptance. So these two parts of the self can be seen. <clears throat> and when we start paying attention, in the beginning, it seems difficult to be able to observe this. But as we go on, we see that it is possible and it is easy for us to see what I am and also to see what is my natural acceptance. So if any moment, I'm taking, thinking of taking revenge from someone. I can see my thoughts and I can see the feeling behind this thought. So deep down, there is a feeling of opposition on the basis of which I'm thinking of taking revenge. So my thought is regarding the revenge, which is based on my feeling of opposition. And I can also see that this feeling of opposition is not naturally acceptable to me. And therefore, the moment I have this feeling of opposition, I'm in a state of contradiction within and therefore unhappiness within. And with that feeling of unhappiness, I am thinking of taking revenge. So if I take, think of this taking revenge for two hours and after two hours, I drop the idea. These two hours I have suffered. I have been in a state of unhappiness because I was in a state of contradiction within. And that is because this feeling of opposition that I had is not naturally acceptable to me. So all this we can see. But then we have to start, you know, observing this self, start observing what <clears throat> I am in terms of my desire, thought and expectation, and then ask whether this feeling that we have, the desire that we have is naturally acceptable or not naturally acceptable. So in, to begin with, it is, seems to be difficult because our practice and our tendencies have been to look outside. And we thought that is what is important. But now that we understand that the self is important and all these details of the self are important, then we'll start paying attention to it. And when we start paying attention to it, it is possible for us to see. Yeah, now, just uh, one point here that uh, so far, what has been covered in the course is, uh, you know, it doesn't include this coexistence and so on. So this part can be for our understanding uh, as teachers, as people who are going to share. Uh, so this answer as it is uh, may not be, you know, very applicable directly for the students who have just gone through up to this point, you know, they have just gone through the 
first lecture or lecture number four, as Prashar Ji was saying. Yeah. So, can you comment on that part also? <coughs> See, uh, Ron, uh, we are responding to questions. We have to respond, you know, at many levels. So the most uh, primordial level is that I respond to the question, keeping in mind, you know, where the person who is asking the question stands. Let's say in this case, the students. So when I'm responding to the student, I will think in terms of what has been covered in the first lecture and not beyond that, which is quite true. So I have to take care of that. But then I have to also respond in terms of, you know, what uh, uh, the uh, answer is in terms of, you know, when you really try to go about investigating the reality, you know, what would be the answer? You know? And that too, you know, answer in the process and its completeness. So when I'm trying to understand right, what will be the, you know, suitable answer for for me to help you proceed further in that process of understanding. And then the third level of answer would be, you know, that when you understand, then how things look like. So broadly speaking, these three levels you know, of response would be required. Right. So number one is responding on the basis of what the other person has you know, the understanding of, or what the other person, you know, has been informed about. Number two is responding at the level when the other person is in the process of understanding things, you know, trying to understand, explore, you know, investigate within. And third is that, you know, when you investigate and understand what, how it looks like. So I'm trying to, uh, respond uh, keeping in mind the teachers as you said you know in uh, the second level and the third level so i am trying to uh, help this the help the teachers who are already in the process of exploring and understanding to see these points you know number one number two you know, what would be ultimately the... Yeah, know, that's very uh, correct, Ganeshi. Ultimately, that, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, conditions... When we respond reality. to the students, we'll use this kind of essence of the response. Yeah. So, uh, for example, if I had to respond to the students, you know, the first level of response. Yeah. I would say that you verify for yourself what is naturally acceptable to you? You know, the feeling of relationship or opposition, harmony or disharmony, coexistence or struggle. I would have asked the students to do this homework. And when the students are able to verify that what is naturally acceptable to them is the relationship, harmony and coexistence. Then I would say that, yes, this is the essence of this whole existence. This is what we see all around. You know, when we look at the nature, when we look at the existence, you know, this is what we see all around, and this is what is naturally acceptable to us, and this is what is the essence. And when we are saying, you know, we can understand everything, this is what we mean, that we can understand the essence of this existential reality. So that's how I would go about it, number one. Number two, I would ask the students to, you know, uh, kind of start observing within themselves and start observing this, you know, what is their desire, thought and expectation that is their imagination. And also observe whether this desire, this feeling that they have is naturally acceptable to them or not naturally acceptable to them. So instead of taking these things as, you know, given, I would have asked these students to explore themselves. And what once they are able to explore themselves, then I'll take that as the basis and, you know, place this answer. 
Exactly. But I presume that the teachers for whom we are, uh, you know, responding, they are already in the process and would have that minimum, you know, kind of uh, uh, background. Yeah, that out, is, yeah. Uh, yeah, outcome of their process of investigation. Yes. In that sense, you know, they have that minimum background. Yes. But I would certainly not mind if uh, you know, uh, the answers are to be given from these three levels, from the point of the you know uh, students who are just being introduced, then from the point of view of the teachers who are in the process, or even the students who are in the process. And third is that if you see the reality in its completeness, then how does it look like? Yes. Yes, so I think I mean, whatever answer we are giving should be uh, filtered uh, on the basis of these three levels of response. Very true. And if anybody feels that some you know level is important to be responded here and it is missing, you can mention about it, and I would like to you know kind of. Uh, present it from that angle or respond it from that angle or that level. Yeah, because uh, the uh, people who are here in this session, uh, we have, you know, a mixture and uh, it should not be taken as that, uh, you know, this whole response can be given to the students, the first time students, so they may get uh, uh, you know, more confused if we give this whole whole answer to start with. So if it is split into these three parts, whoever is we are taking notes and all that, so we have to split it into these three parts. One part has to do with what kind of answer is relevant for first-time students who are coming to this course. And then the second part will have uh, the more, you know, other points for uh, reflection and uh, the complete answer or the you know when you see it in completeness that is for our background to keep it at the background but not necessarily to be uh, shared every time you know in the class to start with to start with but we must have that at our background yes because from there we get the answer for first two levels and we get the confidence that yes, this is how it is, and we can explore that. So it certainly is very useful. Very useful. True. Yeah. So I would say that whatever I'm responding, you know, uh, uh, you take, you decide which level I'm responding, number one. Number two, the other levels, if it is left out, you can fill up yourself. Or if you think it's important to ask immediately, you can certainly ask me and I would like to respond, you know, from different levels also, I mean, whatever level is left out. Yes. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, then these questions uh, that what is the need for self-exploration? The existence is so vast and I'm such a tiny unit. You already sort of mentioned that, you know, you can understand the essence. Yes. So that would be the answer to this, I suppose. But if there's anything else you want to add. Um, and one important thing is that, you know, people have explored, so many people have explored. So what is wrong in assuming what is written? Why should I, I verify everything? This is is something that you know people keep asking yeah this is I, very interesting i would say you know that uh, this existence is so vast and each one of us is an integral part integral unit in this existence and if you look at the in terms of size yes it's quite disproportionate we seem to be very tiny, you know, in this whole existence, in such a vast existence. But the interesting thing is that though we are very small, you know, every self has this capacity to understand 
this nature and to realize this coexistence. So this is something which is built in, in every self. You know, that he has the need or it has the need to know and it has the potential to know. So we have the need to know and we have the potential to know this vast existential reality. So if you look at the human child, for example, right, he wants to know. And if you respond to him or her with affection, then he will ask question about everything that he sees around, about himself, about the parents, about the plants, about the trees, and everything that he you know, comes around, comes in contact with. So that need to know is there. And what we are saying is that we have the potential to know. Only thing that we have to do is to realize that, yes, we want to know and we can know. We have the potential and we have to materialize this potential. So we have the potential. We have to convert it into the competence. And that is what we are trying to do. That is what we are trying to do. That if we start looking within, right, we find that this whole existence is reflected into me. And if I start paying attention, I can see it. And what we said in the last question is that the essence of this existential reality is this relationship, harmony, and coexistence. And we already have this natural acceptance for it. So it is there as an inbuilt part of my being. This natural acceptance for relationship, harmony, and coexistence, which is there. And in the process of exploration, if you look at all the reality, you know, it has to do with this material unit, the consciousness unit, and the space. You know, and we all have this you know, self as a consciousness unit, this body as a material unit. And this is all in space. So we can, you know, go about investigating it. So the potential is there. The need is there to know the existential reality. The potential is there to explore, to see, to investigate, you know, by way of paying attention to it and observing it. So we only have to work for it. And when we work for it, we are able to understand this whole existence, you know, in its essence first. And when we understand it in a sense, right, we can work out the finer details as and when required. So whenever I'm interacting with a new unit, then I can work out the necessary details which are required. But I always have that essence you know, at the background, which I have been able to understand by exploring, investigating into this existential reality directly through my process of self-exploration. So though the existence is vast, but the essence is very simple. Relationship, harmony, and coexistence, right? With respect to the material unit, the consciousness unit, and the space. So this is the matrix of the essence of this whole vast existence. The essence I can understand. So when we are saying explore within, we are saying explore within this essence of this whole existence, right? In terms of relationship, harmony, and coexistence over these units, material units, the consciousness units, and the space. And this can be done. This is one thing. Second thing is that, you know, uh, yes, people have explored, investigated, and found out the truth, the reality, the essence of the reality. 
So why not take it and why do we go want to go about exploring? The answer is simple, you know, when we are talking about this process of self-exploration, you know, we saw that we do want to verify things for ourselves that need to know, that need to explore, verify, understand, realize is something which is there in each one of us. So each one of us want to explore and know and realize right, this whole existential reality. So this is an inbuilt requirement. So if others have explored and investigated and have seen the truth and they are proposing it as a you know, uh, kind of uh, statement of reality, a statement of truth, then it's good, you know, that proposal can be a good beginning for me. It is you know, it's setting up a direction for me. But then I would certainly like to explore myself. And when I'm exploring myself, it is not putting a disbelief on those people who have explored it, you know, in the past, but it is taking the inspiration from them right? and trying to, you know, explore myself because that's my very primary need. So I have respect for it, you know, people who have explored, investigated and seen this essence of the reality. So I take their statements as proposals, their guidance as proposals. And I start exploring within. So when I explore within and see it for myself, I confirm what they have done. Right? I have this sense of gratitude you know, for them. But I also you know, have explored myself and therefore I have that self-confidence in me. So the role of those who have done this exploration in the past is to, you know, help us getting the right proposals. So with kind of respect and gratitude for them, we will take these proposals, but we'll investigate it ourselves, explore it ourselves, you know, and understand, realize through this process of self-exploration. And with that, you know, we will have that sense of gratitude much you know, deeper than what we had to begin with. So the difference between having this faith and having this reverence is essentially this, that I begin with this assumption that what they have said is right. So somewhere I have that faith, but when I explore it within and I find that this is the truth, right? Then I have this reverence for them, you know, that deep sense of gratitude and acceptance for the other. So that's how, you know, it goes. So I would certainly like to confirm by way of, you know, my self-exploration, both in terms of my natural acceptance and in terms of my living with it, you know, in a mutually fulfilling manner. Yes, <coughs> that uh, gives a very good idea about, you know, why many, many of us have sort of rejected so many things in the tradition that it's like, you know, it's not much use. Because we have not explored, we have not seen, and we maybe we started with this preconditioning that what is old is not useful. Yeah, in fact, we have both kind of things. We have people, you know, who think that everything that is said in the tradition is all true. And we should not ask questions. And we should not ask questions. Yes, that is also there. They so become we have uh, a whole lot of people. But we are not saying that. We are saying that a tradition has a lot of valuable things. You know, people in the past have spent their, you know, their life searching for truth. And whatever they have found as truth, they have spent their life you know, uh, kind of uh, authenticating it. So we have you know, kind of gratitude for them, you know, reverence for them. We have regards for them. You know, and we would certainly like to take what they have said as good proposals for us to explore and verify. So this is one thing. But then now we have another set of people which do think that whatever is said in the tradition is all useless, is all meaningless. You know. It is just murmuring of you know, whatever. And there are myths and stories. Myths and stories. So these people, they discard the tradition okay, without even looking at it. 
So what we are saying is that don't discard it just, you know, because it is something in the tradition. You know, look at it, explore, investigate yourself, and find out whatever is true. You know, accept it and be with it. Whatever is not true, discard it. But that discard thing is meaningful only when I have done this investigation, this exploration. So what we are saying is that whatever is said in the tradition, take it as a good proposal, but verify it yourself. And only when you verify for yourself, you can be self-confident about it. And you can also be creative about it. So when you can verify the essence, understand the essence, then with that essence at the you know, base, you can be very creative in terms of fulfillment of your relationship on the basis of this understanding of the essence. So you'll be more creative than what you are. And you'll be able to relate to what has been done in the past, you know, in the tradition. So people have spent their life, you know, and generations have spent their life to explore the reality, understand the reality, you know, and to live with that reality you know, in a uh, mutually fulfilling manner. So all that is valuable for us. But we don't take it as a blind faith. We don't take it as given, you know, as truth. We take them as good proposals. Right? We may work with them, but then we can explore and verify them ourselves. And on the basis of that self-verification, on the basis of that understanding born out of it, we can be self-confident. And we can also be confident about you know, what good has been done in the tradition. And we can be creative. We can, you know, give more meaningful expression to it in the present time. In fact, that thing that we were talking about, that when it comes to feelings, right, they are universal. Feelings in relationship, they are universal. But when it comes to expression of these feelings, it can be local you know, there can be varieties, right? So fulfillment of the feeling, for example, feeling of respect, this expression can be in different ways. And when we understand this feeling and the expression, then we can have more creative expression at the present time. So what we have, you know, if we look at the whole tradition of thousands of years of, you know, the human society, what we will find that these feelings have remained the same, you know, over time, but their expressions keep changing, you know, depending upon the time, the place, the, you know, culture and so on. So when we understand this, we are able to accept those basic essence, you know, those basic feelings in relation to the whole reality, the human being and the rest of nature. And we hold on to that basic feeling, which are universal. But when it comes to the expression of it, we are able to give a very fresh interpretation, you know, expression and very creative expression to those feelings. So we will be able to understand and accept what has been said in the past in terms of the essence and we will be able to give a very creative expression to it, you know, at the present time. So this uh, experiential validation uh, is important. Yes, both. Both are important. Trying on the basis of natural acceptance is important. And then this experiential validation is also important. So this because experiential validation confirms, I mean, this natural acceptance cons confirms that yes, it is in line with the essence of existential reality. And this experiential validation confirms that when we live with this, it leads to mutual fulfillment. So that means uh, 
uh, if uh, my conclusion is based on experience of events that is one kind of validation but if my ex ex this uh, um, conclusion is based on something that i have seen as you know um, clearly uh, as understanding or you know at that level then it will apply to everything everybody so for example uh, trust with one person and not with another person based on events is different from trust which is based on uh, seeing that my natural acceptance is the same as uh, other people's natural acceptance yeah that is what i'm saying that both these things are important verifying on the basis of natural acceptance is important and verifying on the basis of this experiential validation is also important so now if you see right <clears throat> that moment i have a feeling of trust in me or feeling of respect in me this feeling is naturally acceptable to me and therefore with this feeling i am in a state of harmony within and therefore a state of happiness within this i can see and by seeing this i can also conclude that like me the other person will also have a natural acceptance for the feeling of trust so when i express this feeling of trust to the other and he receives that feeling of trust then he will also have a natural acceptance for it therefore it will lead to a state of harmony within him and a state of happiness within him so just by looking at my natural acceptance i am able to see that this trust is a feeling which is naturally acceptable to me and naturally acceptable to everyone else and therefore if it will lead to my happiness and happiness of the other with whom i am sharing this feeling of trust however when it comes to this experiential validation in terms of behaving with other human being with this feeling of respect right there are two parts one is this natural acceptance for this feeling of trust the second part is my expression of this feeling of trust and the reception of this feeling of trust from the other person so these are two things now on the basis of this natural acceptance i can see that yes i will i have a feeling of you know, i have a acceptance natural acceptance for the feeling of trust and the other person will also have this natural acceptance for feeling of trust so it will lead to a state of mutual happiness however if there is some problem at the level of expression of my feeling of trust or there is some problem at the level of the reception of this feeling of trust at the other end <clears throat> then it is possible that this feeling is not getting communicated and therefore it may not lead to this mutual happiness so there i can see that the problem is not with the feeling but the problem is you know in my expression or the problem is in the reception of the other so that is where i have to work that is where i have to work work at the level of work you know ensuring that i have the right kind of expression of my feeling and also work at the level of you know helping the other human being to develop that competence to rightly receive this feeling right so these are you know when it comes to experiential validation both these things are important this 
my expression and his reception for example if somebody has doubt on my behavior already then even this feeling of respect which i am expressing to him right he might interpret as my you know helplessness and if he interprets it as my helplessness okay then this feeling of respect is not communicated to him and therefore he does not feel you know that harmony within and happiness within he might even get you know um, very disturbed about it so what is being said is that if i verify things on the basis of natural acceptance then i can be definite but if i verify it only on the basis of this experiential validation then i may get into trouble if there is some problem in my expression or there is some problem in the reception of the other person so the natural acceptance part is probably more important yes i would say both of them are important both but first one has to be ensured first with that comes definiteness then the second one can be ensured you know by way of developing this competence for expression and for reception so that is what we have said that has to be rectified you know and that takes time so in fact this at the level of natural acceptance we can verify things immediately at the level of experiential validation if there is gap in my expression or his reception then we have to improve upon that we have to rectify that and that takes time in behavior we can see this um, but when we say mutual prosperity with nature what does that mean mutual prosperity with rest of nature means that when i am engaging with the rest of nature let's say for example plants trees soil and so on now this engagement is what we are calling as work so when we are working with the rest of nature does it ensure prosperity for me as a human being does it ensure the prosperity of the rest of nature so take a very simple example if i plant a guava tree right then i am doing something to nurture this tree first to plant and then nurture this tree so i am putting some man, you know manure there some soil you know water there and some other things now i am doing something for this plant and after one or two years this plant grows and it starts giving fruit right and it gives so much of fruit that i cannot even you know finish eating it myself so i spend few hours or few days nurturing this plant but then this plant gives fruits for years so this is a process in which i am working for the prosperity of this plant for you know nurturing this plant and this what i get out of this plant in terms of fruits in terms of leaves in terms of twigs in terms of say, wood you know is you know helping in my prosperity so this is leading to mutual prosperity my prosperity as well as the prosperity of the rest of nature so this is the way the whole nature is when the plant is growing on the soil the plant is being enriched by the soil and the soil is also being enriched by the plant because the leaves the fruits the flowers that fall on the ground on the soil and you know degenerates into soil finally the quality of soil 
the fertility of the soil improves rather than you know getting um, <coughs> uh, exploited so it is it is being enriched so both the tree and the plant are in and both the soil and the tree are enriched in the process similarly when we as human being interact with the rest of nature this plant for example we can enrich the plant and the plant will enrich us but unfortunately we have developed process of production today which are not ensuring this mutual prosperity mutual enrichment and this is what is creating the problem of you know pollution and problem of resource depletion the two major problem that we see relating to the environment right this process you know this problem of increasing problem of this problem you know pro pollution the uh, global warming you know and this problem of resource depletion both of these problems are there because we are not working out the process of production which are mutually enriching which ensures the mutual prosperity so if we really want to solve that problem you know and be sure about the continuity of this you know uh, kind of and a uh, rich nature then we have to work for this mutual prosperity we have to take up the production systems which are you know ensuring this mutual prosperity yes we can learn a lot from nature yes, yes. um yeah we are the integral part of the nature and we have to learn from nature from the existence yes um you mention uh, self organization being self organized swatantra so is that the same as freedom can you explain this a little bit or give some examples about it yeah this is something very interesting particularly in the uh, uh, so called modern world there is so much of emphasis on freedom freedom is considered to be one of the primary values today but we need to understand what is freedom we need to understand what is freedom generally it means that i am free to do what i feel like i am free to do what i feel like or in other words i am free from any restriction i am free from any restriction so when you define freedom as being free from any restriction then it is a negative definition then it is a negative definition that there are certain things around which are forcing me and i don't want to go with those enforcement right i want to you know disobey them or not you know obey them so that is the meaning of freedom from you know these restrictions so this is fine but this is not enough so we should not be forced to do things we should not you know there should not be unnecessary restrictions put on us but the second part is freedom to do something 
freedom to do something. When we are saying self-organized, what we are saying is that we are free to do what is right for me. It is not just free to do whatever I feel like. Because what I like may be based on my understanding or based on my preconditioning. <laughs> if it is based on my understanding, it is fine. If it is based on my preconditioning without understanding things, then it is likely to get into trouble. So when we say freedom from something, that's a negative definition. It is not really giving us what to do. But when we say freedom to do something, then it can be a positive thing. But freedom to do what? That we have to decide. So when we are able to see what is naturally acceptable to us as a human being, as a self, right? What is my very basic, you know, being? What is my natural acceptance? And if I work in accordance to that, in accordance with that natural acceptance, then I'm self-organized. Then I'm in a state of Swatantrata. Right. So I have developed a system which is based on my natural acceptance. So in that sense, I am self-organized. And when I'm self-organized, it is fulfilling for me and it is you know, fulfilling for others also. On the other hand, if I have not verified things on the basis of my natural acceptance, and I do not know what is natural for me, right, then I'm free to do what I like, but this liking may or may not be in line with my natural acceptance. If it is in line with my natural acceptance, it will lead to harmony and happiness. If it is not in line with my natural acceptance, it will lead to disharmony, contradiction, and unhappiness. And this is what is happening. So in the name of freedom, we are indulging into things, right, which are many times not in line with our natural acceptance. But we do it in the name of freedom. And because it is not in line with our natural acceptance, right, we are in a state of contradiction within and a state of unhappiness within. And when I express this feeling with the other, then I create problem for the other, create unhappiness for the other. For example, you can, you know, have this uh, feeling of cooperation or feeling of competition. Both these possibilities are there, right? Like when you say you are free to compete, it seems to be a very good thing. Right. But the moment you think in terms of competition and not cooperation, then you have this feeling of opposition within. And with this feeling of opposition, you are in a state of disharmony within, contradiction within because this feeling of opposition is not naturally acceptable to you. So you are in a state of unhappiness within. And when you are expressing this to the other, the other also is you know, becoming uncomfortable, unhappy within. So though we may assume that you know, competition is something essential in the society and we may promote this and we consider this as a freedom if everybody is given the you know, option to compete. But essentially what is happening is we are making ourselves unhappy and we are making others unhappy. <clears throat> when I see it in terms of self-organization, I can see that, yes, I will, what is naturally acceptable to me is the feeling of cooperation. 
so i will think of cooperation i will you know have this feeling of cooperation with him right and that will make me happy in a state of harmony and happiness with him and then when i cooperate with others you know express this feeling of cooperation and work with the other and cooperate then it gives a feeling you know uh, of uh, cooperation you know to the other and which is naturally acceptable to him and therefore creates a feeling of ha- harmony and happiness within and in the process of course we are able to do things much better than what we do with competition so working with cooperation will lead to a state of swatantrata because that is what is naturally acceptable to me but working with competition will lead to some kind of you know uh, unhappiness for both of us who are involved in the process so though it may look like a freedom that we are you know free to compete with everybody but this competition itself or this feeling of opposition which is at the base of this competition is not something which is naturally acceptable so this is the difference between the freedom and the you know self organization or swatantrata in fact most of the time this freedom is taken as freedom from so i don't care for what my parents say i don't care for the you know society i don't care for this you know uh, tradition right i do whatever i feel like and this is interesting you know you say that you do whatever you feel like but if you ask this question to the other person you know how do you decide what you feel like you know or where where is it decided i remember one of my friends you know son quite adult and he would say that i do whatever i feel like and i don't bother you know. so the, he will not listen to the parents to the teachers so one day i was discussing with him and i said you know i am in favor of this swatantrata and you know the freedom and he said yes true i am also in favor of it so then i asked him what is this meaning of freedom and he said <coughs> i do what i feel like i follow no restrictions so i said that's very good but how do you decide for your liking this is my question so he was taken aback i said okay let me take an example to demo, you know explain i said you go to a restaurant you know and if this better comes and asks you know what should i bring and you said bring a coca cola right because you happen to like coca cola now let's look at this how did i like this coca cola how did it come so 20 times 30 times 100 times you see this you know zindagi hota hai aise one of the advertisement of this coca cola right? they don't explain kaisi but they tell you zindagi hota hai aise so if you drink coca cola your life will become very different very happy and very joyous so now this has become your liking and you think that you are free because you are doing what you like but this liking is decided by somebody else by the advertisement by the systems right so this liking itself is a patantrata you know you are being dictated by this advertisement now you are being dictated by the advertisement right so that liking is being dictated by the advertisement and with that liking king and now you are trying to become free free to do what you like so first you are forced then you are given so you are free to choose what you like which is decided by the system by the advertisement which is forced by others so this is how what you know is going on in the name of freedom today and in fact if you look at the whole process which is go- which has been going on all the- over the world you know for last 2 300 years 
is that many of these invasions which have taken place you know, by uh, one society over the other society, you know, one of the way to dismantle that society which is being dominated is by way of treating and you know, training these children or educating the children to disown or to disrespect or discard whatever has been there in the tradition of that society before. So we have, you know, we can see what we are doing in India, in Nepal, in Bhutan, in many of these countries. You can see that one of the essential thing that is being somehow, you know, generated is this, that we discard the tradition you know, as something being forced on us. It, without evaluating it, without exploring it, without investigating it. And this we do in the name of freedom. So for Swatantrata, I mean, what we are asking for is Swatantrata. And Swatantrata, the self-organized means I'm able to see what is my natural acceptance, what is natural for me. And that becomes the basis of my feeling, my thought, my action. Then with that feeling, that thought, you know, that behavior, I'm in a state of harmony with him. And I can be in a state of harmony with the other person that has a potential. So that is the state of being self-organized. And of course, we can take examples at the individual level, at the family level, at the society level, at the nature level, you know. <clears throat> so, uh, for example, at the level of family, you know, when I see that, you know, these feelings in relationship, feeling of trust, respect, and so on, are naturally acceptable to me, and I have this feeling with me, and I'm sharing this feeling with other members of the family, then I can ensure harmony within the family. Right? This is the state of Swatantrata, I would say. This is the state of self-organized. Similarly, when I'm interacting with the rest of nature, I can interact with the rest of nature in a manner of mutual fulfillment, this mutual prosperity that we are talking about. So this feeling of mutual fulfillment is something which is naturally acceptable. So if I have this feeling and if I'm interacting with the nature, rest of nature with this feeling, it will lead to mutual enrichment, mutual prosperity, fulfilling for me and fulfilling for the other. Right? This is a state of satantrata. <clears throat> but if I think that I can cut as many trees as I want and not plant even a single one, right? this is freedom. This is not Satantrata, this is not self-organization. I may do it for a while with the resources which are available, but soon I am going to get into trouble for myself and for the rest of nature. Yes, and we are seeing so many examples of that today. Yes. Yes. So what is happening in the name of freedom is that we are trying to get rid of the enforcement from outside, you know, trying to be free from of the external process, process, but we are succumbing to this internal process. Internal pressures of sensation and preconditioning, which are created by the environment. So we have become slaves to this, you know, internal process of sensation and preconditioning which are created by the environment and we are not even aware of it. So we think that we are free, but we have become slaves. So we are talking about how we can be free in the real sense, free to do what is our natural acceptance and not being forced to do what is not our natural acceptance. So in English, uh, what would be the word for Swatantata? I mean, that... Uh, I mean, this is the best word we could think is yeah. self-organized. <laughs> self yeah, freedom is not the 
right word, you know, because this freedom has this notion, as we were saying, freedom from and freedom to. So freedom from something and freedom to do something. In fact, one of the uh, person by name Eric Fromm, he has written a book called Escape from Freedom. Escape so very from freedom. He talks about this freedom from and freedom to. So this notion, you know, that I have to free from restriction is not a very rich, you know, notion. I have to be free to do what I, you know, naturally accept, not only just what I like, but what is naturally acceptable to me. That is going to be the right kind of freedom. It, of course, you know, takes care of this you know, free from being under the external pressure or even the internal process, pressure. Yeah. Mrs. Vasi Reddy is asking in chat, how can we explore Swatantrata in the workplace? Yeah, in fact, this is interesting, you know, what we have done is that without, we, because we have not been referring to our natural acceptance and not working for this harmony within, we have not been able to develop systems which are in line with this, you know, something which leads to harmony within and harmony with the world outside. So we have to develop those systems. I mean, not that we have not developed any such system. We have developed such systems. And many of these old traditions, if you look at them, they did try to work on this and they have developed you know, many systems which are in line with this. You know. For example, in the family, the mother and the child, for example, the mother has a feeling of care for the child, you know, a feeling of affection and care for the child. Right? So she takes care of the child. Now, when the mother is taking care of the child, it is fulfilling for the mother and it is also fulfilling for the child. Right? If the grandparents are, you know, giving guidance to the child, it is fulfilling for the grandparents and it is also fulfilling for the child. So we can develop such systems, right? And we did develop many of such systems. And yeah. most of it, yeah. So yeah. I, what I was saying is that these such systems have been developed in the past. So we should evaluate them and see, you know, if they are useful, we can, you know, go with them. Even in the present time, we'll have many systems which are taking care of this, but there are many systems which are not taking care of this. Those systems, we have to set them right. Very true. We have to set them right. So for work, for example, you know, if I'm in the teaching, right, I want to explain to the students what I have understood, you know, and the students want to understand what is right. So I have this feeling of guidance for them and they have this feeling of, you know, learning from me, you know, learning the reality. So this, uh, you know, kind of uh, willingness from both sides, if that becomes the basis, then this teaching and learning can be a very fulfilling process. Right? And if you look at the role of management in this process, the role of management is to facilitate such kind of teaching and learning. So this is possible. Yeah. And this today, certainly, uh, like Dr. Gita is saying that in educational institutions itself, this Swatantata is missing. So that is uh, true that the current systems are where they are. And once we look into our natural acceptance and you know go in that direction, 
then the systems will in you know in uh, time to come will go in that right direction yes true i mean this morning session for example is a good example of it yeah so <laughs> most of us you know i mean and many of us would never get up at 5:30 right but now we are getting up at 5 o'clock getting ready by 5:30 attending the session taking notes doing all these things right yes and without any enforcement right so no exams no course no evaluation right no other motivation except that you know we want to share what we have learned and we find that this sharing is valuable Yeah. So it is possible, you know, to make this teaching and learning, you know, the sharing, a very fulfilling process. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, and we'll meet tomorrow morning uh, as usual. Yes.